boat and by train, by rickshaw, sedan, chair, occasionally even on foot. I have circumnavigated the world in the footsteps of Mark Twain. A century ago, he wrote a book following the equator. And in his faded traces, I've now reached journey's end, the coastal waters of South Africa. It's a country I've steered clear of before, for obvious reasons. But where better to start my reconciliation than by sailing to a place where past, present, and future collide? To the political Alcatraz of the Southern Hemisphere, Robben Island. Identity and belonging have been my themes, the stubborn endurance of people brutalized by their history. Thank you very much. Can there be hope and forgiveness in a country which has endured so much cruelty? Empty prisons breathe their own poisonous vapor. In Twain's day, this wind-lashed island was a British dumping ground for the unwanted. Here came lepers, lunatics, vagrants, and political detainees, the detritus of an empire. When Nelson Mandela arrived in 1963, it was a top security prison. Its warders all white, its prisoners black or colored. Mandela spent 18 years of his incarceration. Lionel Davis was also a political prisoner here. Today, he's my guide. In the beginning, we had one single mat that we slept on, a sisal mat. And because it was so bitterly cold, they were forced to give us another mat. So we had a sisal mat and a felt mat. We had three blankets for winter and two for summer. Okay. Are we allowed in? Yes, you are allowed. It's really hallowed territory by now. My goodness, well, there's not much room to move. No, there's not. A bed, of course, would stretch from this side of the wall to that side. And Mandela could just about... Well, he's tall. He's tall, yeah. yes. And uh, he had to sleep a bit cramped, but it was a great improvement from the time when we slept on mats. You then in Apartheid divided prisoners Otherwise, between blacks like Mandela and coloreds of mixed or Asian descent like Lionel. Blacks were given worse food to eat, fewer clothes to wear, an attempt to divide and rule which failed. The most wonderful opportunity we had, you know, to talk about these differences, we understood other people's culture, and I think this, for me, was the most humanizing experience. Hmm. That, you know, over the years, all of that prejudice that you were, we were all born with, it just, you know, dissipated. Do you really think that we're born with prejudices? I think when we become conscious, we, we, we inherit prejudices. I, I was always very impressed with the fact that, that small children are really born without prejudice. They acquire it with education and with family background. Seeing whites, you know, and not being con politically conscious, I saw whites around me and everything that was wrong, I laid at the doors of whites. So I was extremely anti-white. In fact, when I was a young man, I got seven you know, strokes with a cane at the police station for allegedly having assaulted a white person, which made me even more anti-white. I and can understand that. Through my political, joining political organization, and becoming political, politically conscious. Today, I am not anti-white. I'm not anti-anything, you know, when, when it comes to people. But I'm pro-love, I'm pro-peace. Well, there we have a lot in common. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you. And thank you for not being anti-white. It made the whole thing very much easier. <laughs> <laughs> In South Africa, all the old targets seem to have changed. I've just come back from Robben Island. And now you must know how I feel, seeing where my taxpayers' money is going. It's not going into welfare or health or education. It's all going into Robben Island. Why? Because Robben Island is becoming a, quote, monument to the struggle for democracy, unquote. Oh, wake me when it's over. <laughs> I mean, what? What about a 
monument to us white liberals. Hey? Peter Dirk Ace is a celebrated political lampoonist who for years enjoyed humiliating Mandela's jailers. How can they forget? I bossed a black baby for democracy during a state of emergency. I went into a black township, risked my life and my husband's Mercedes. I got a black baby, took it home. I bossed it. I bossed it, not Dora, me, me. Anyway, Dora says they don't bath black babies, they have new ones. I bathed it! <laughs> like Lionel on Robben Island, Peter Dirk Ace has had to find fresh targets for his satire. Luckily, whites today are learning to laugh at themselves with his help. Is this your first visit to South Africa? Yes, absolutely. Oh. Well, yeah, will you have a chance to meet Nelson Mandela? We hope so. It'd be wonderful. It'd be wonderful. Uh, Desmond Tutu, I know. Yes. Tutu has this great, a great line which I use everywhere. Love your enemy, it'll ruin his reputation. That's marvelous. 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 Isn't that I mean, just That's a great yes. philosophy. Yes. Do you know how wonderful it is to see you here live? Do you know what it takes us to get you here live? <laughs> because we know you don't want to leave your homes, especially not at night. Hey. <laughs> because that means you've got to pick up your security keys again. <laughs> and then you get to the front door and you've got to open your front door. <laughs> <laughs> and your veranda is covered in barbed wire. And the walls are getting higher and higher and higher and higher. And right up there, the electricity is going. <laughs> and down here in the moat, the crocodile. <laughs> and then you go out for the evening, and when you get back, your house is gone. The interesting thing is how they laugh at that sequence about the guns and the walls and the crocodiles and the violence. That's wonderful, yeah, sure. And it is so real. I mean, it's not funny because it happens all the time, and yet somehow laughing at the fear makes that fear less fearful. From 1976 to 90, everything I talked about was death. It was all death. We shot children, we killed people, we murdered people, we destroyed self-respect. We were just... It was like cancer. Yeah. And suddenly it's not. It's the culture of life. I mean, it is optimistic it is still fraught with problems but at least we can solve the problems the old days there was like we i didn't know how it was going to end i mean we all expected you know that bloodbath that everybody said well one day you're going to be punished and i think the irony is we're still waiting i mean is it possible that we got away with all that before i traveled deeper into modern black south africa can one ever totally avoid the memory of its insalubrious past? Twain had described the white Boer population here as profoundly ignorant, dull, obstinate, and bigoted. Their treatment of blacks, merciless. Apartheid has been and gone since then, but the obstinate Africana spirit has not entirely. Highway made for sleep. Deep in the erstwhile Orange Free State is a small all white community, a fledgling state of 600 souls seeking eventual independence. If they remain as peaceful as they claim to be, Orania will be a picturesque, dignified threat to no one. However, their ambition is a republic one million strong. Its guiding spirit is Professor Boshoff, the son-in-law of Dr. Verbot, the assassinated architect of apartheid. The patriotic songs in forest clearings are not entirely reassuring. The fact is that uh, either the Afrikaner is going to be integrated in the new Africa, and disappear in history or and live perhaps or survive perhaps in small pockets but that's not the Afrikaner nation and we are sure that the Afrikaner nation has got the will to survive and in order to survive it should make a plan and this is the only plan and this frail, wide-eyed lady is the community's most potent symbol of the Afrikaner's past. Guided by her daughter comes 97-year-old Mrs. Betsy Favort. How do you do? Her husband was stabbed to death in 1966, 
As Prime Minister, he'd constructed the whole apartheid system. Oh. <laughs> She's 97 now. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's just a good age. <laughs> yes, it's a very good age. <laughs> it's a very good age. I feel ashamed of being so young. <laughs> No, you needn't. Uh, I needn't. Oh, that's good of you. Her fragility is a touching epilogue to the repugnance her husband's name still evokes. Well, so I don't. I don't need cushion, really. Nature's been generous. I didn't come here before because I didn't uh, wish to play in front of segregated uh, audiences. And this was a general attitude adopted by trades unions, by all sorts of other things. Now I'm absolutely delighted to come. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, to visit you in your uh, little piece of paradise, which you've created for yourselves. I'm so pleased that I came here. It was the best thing I could have done. And you enjoy it? Very much. Surrounded by your own. Well, it's a, it's a quiet, and we haven't got the other people yeah. with us. We've got all the whites. Everything is white. So that makes it easy for us and safe. It's very safe. I see. You had uh, Mr. Mandela to tea, I guess. He was a, an important person. Yes. And I was quite pleased to receive him. And he took out my best cups and saucers and things. In that case, you were the wise one. I think so. I certainly think so. I think that's enough, eh? Well, there's no reason why I shouldn't receive him. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> In a township near Johannesburg is the precise reverse of Orania's mood of insecurity and militancy. Under apartheid, coloreds and blacks were forbidden from dancing together. Today, the romantic combinations are unrestricted. To these children, what they see is the natural order, born and apparently raised without any evident prejudice. Waiting their turn are 11 year old Tammy and the intriguingly named Siswe, her partner. Siswe. 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 And what does that mean? Nation. Which? Nation. Nation? So you're a one man nation? Yes. Oh, that's very nice to hear. Have you won any trophies yet? Yes. You have? Yes. How many? 20. 20? 20 trophies at your age for ballroom dancing? Yes. Well, allow me to be uh, not the last or the first, but one of the <laughs> many who congratulate you. Thank you. 20, so you're hoping to add a 21st tonight? Yes. My goodness, I'm terribly jealous. I've never won any for ballroom dancing. <laughs> what do you hope to do later? You do, do you want to dance in your later life? Mm, yes. Mm, I'll dance until I'm a professional. And then I'll stop, and I pass my trick, go to university, and I'm going to start being a soccer player. A soccer player? Really? With, I mean, well, ballroom dancing can only help, because it makes you nimble, it makes you quick. Mm, I see that way, but I can't on a dance the whole time. I've got to get done with life. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> But tonight, the determined young Siswe and his dancing partner, Tammy, have a tough night of competition ahead. Ballroom is South Africa's third most popular cultural activity. And winning their 21st trophy won't be easy. Although there's plenty of confidence in this now well-established pair. Two years I've been dancing with Siswe, two years. And I think I've danced with him forever. And then, are you intending to be a champion or what? I am. I am intending to be a champion. What's he like? He's fun. He's, he's uh, talking and he's exciting. 
It's hard not to envy Tammy and Siswi's ambition, their energy and youth. They still encounter some universal prejudices, but for now the pessimists have fallen silent. Just as on the dance floor, it is the opportunities and not the obstacles people are choosing to see. Almost everyone, Tani and Siswe included, will get a prize. Outside the ballroom, it's too early to say who the winners and losers will be. enjoyed South Africa's trains. Easy riding, fine cars, all the conveniences. No doubt they had more room for luggage too. On the legendary five-star blue train from Pretoria to Cape Town, so I've been temporarily joined by my wife. Your compartment, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Oh, whoa. Et tout est venu, ça. Right. My wife only travels with the absolute basics for survival. Well, that's all right, how does it go for the night? We'll just sit there. Here are some crudities, as they're called. You want a piece of pineapple, Molly? <laughs> One of my wife's basics for survival is a gourmet lunch. Are you ready for a 12-course lunch? Mm -hmm. Toasty vanilla matured in French oak barrels. That should make you feel at home, is it? I recommend that one. La Motte Blanc Fumé? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have some of that. There's still a long way to go in South Africa. The shanty towns are a world away from my cocoon of luxury. Power may now be black, but the color of money here is still white. I'm about to visit a place Twain marveled at. The greatest novelty the globe has in stock. Diamonds. to locate the wealth hidden beneath this landscape. But it would be the black man who got it out. Our route to Cape Town, I'm stopping at Kimberley, just as Mark Twain did before me, to witness what he called an exciting kind of fashion. Since its acquisition by Cecil Rhodes, the De Beers Mining Company has gone on to dominate the world's diamond trade. Mr. Rhodes is South Africa, said Twain. Rhodes himself said, Remember that you are an Englishman and have therefore won first prize in the lottery of life. His prize was once a hill made into a hole, the biggest man-made hole on earth. Diamonds have triggered a frenzy of digging. Twain reported that one miner was given a horse, a blanket, and $500 for finding a diamond worth millions. But he got no ticket in the lottery of life. As you can see here, the smaller sizes right to the big ones. This will all be broken into about 14,000 categories. 14,000? 14, 14,000 categories. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, here we're getting into recognizable yeah, now, now you can diamonds. See looking at diamonds. Before, it looked to me like some highly qualified dentists having a, a game with fillings. That's what I thought when I started here, that diamonds are only the white ones. I didn't even know they were yellow diamonds, brown diamonds, no. and even those black diamonds. Those will be used for industrial purposes. This is a very special piece of diamond, the 616 carats, the only uh, uncut octahedron as far as we know. It is so unique, the, um, the value of it is in its uniqueness. You want to hold it? If you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Looks to me like an ice cube, but it's almost as cold. Ooh. But no ice cube was ever worth 10 million pounds. I was now about to discover how exciting fishing for diamonds really was. Inspecting the source of this extraordinary wealth in a modern deep mine. Uh, all right, UK science, sir? I have no idea. All right, let me... Uh, you know, it's that's a eh? Oh, it's a ten? very big. You're, you're ten? Yes. Well, then I'm at least eleven. <laughs> I don't want to do any one-upmanship. <laughs> I've joined Manny DiPico, an ex-miner, ex-political prisoner, who is now the state premier of Northern Cape Province. Boats, not diamonds, are what he comes here to collect. Last time this happened was in New Zealand, I seem to remember. Going into a pool with a lot of Maoris, <laughs> discussing the order of the day. <laughs> Am I on the wrong foot? I was trying to put that foot through the armhole. Yeah. My God, that's tight. Yes, okay, I've done it. Uh, I know now why I didn't want to be a miner when I was small. <laughs> or when you were big. I'm being helped by professional now. There At the go. back. The state uh, premier. Is it there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, is right? uh if that's big enough in the crutch, it's big enough. Yes, yeah, big yeah. enough, absolutely. Well, that's fine. Uh, okay. And now I, we do kung fu. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little overdressed for sumo wrestling, but otherwise. Yeah. Slight step down as you get in. Not for the first time on this journey, I was missing the tranquility of my vineyard in Switzerland. Location. 3,000 feet below the surface is quite as deep as I ever want to go. Four and a half ton capacity to oh. take everything out of here. Well, that should see me through. <laughs> I can hear a Welsh choir singing. <laughs> or is it an illusion? Oh, well, it's a bottom. Yeah. It's a bit I'm certainly deeper than Mark Twain, who languished on the surface looking for the glow of those limpid pebbles, which made De Beers so rich. Unfortunately, the nature of modern diamond mining means that you're highly unlikely to see any actual diamonds. The few that there are are hidden in the rock. Manny DePico, my companion, is a familiar face down here. As a young ANC activist, he trawled for diamonds. But he also tried to organize labor and was imprisoned for his efforts. Now he's the premier of the state, a joyful man entirely free from bitterness. When I went into prison, out of the 24 hours, I was spending 18 hours alone in my single cell, solitary confinement. And the other six hours you can mingle with the other inmates. But there you could sing alone and keep saying, because if you don't do that, you get mad. Can you remember them? The songs? Yes. Oh, yes. Can you yes. sing one now? I could sing. C.I.A. Epitole. C.I.A. Epitole. C.I.A. Epitole. C.I.A. That means that we are going to Pretoria, we are going to dismantle it. 
to the ground and Bota uh, Bota Kulula Mandela. Seeing that Bota, you must release Nelson Mandela now. How is the music of that? Bota Bota, Bota Bota, Kulula Mandela, Kulula Mandela, Bota Bota, Kulula Mandela, Kulula Mandela, Zaza Zaza, Kulula Mandela. You see the force of the workers coming. And that was great because it was pushing us all. And, uh, it's contagious. You see, I was... Now, I was now, uh... now I'm a premier. I can't talk those things. <laughs> now the workers are calling. I said, man, uh, we are not... Uh, they sing songs about me. <laughs> they need more improvements. Such a wonderful thing now. Away from the ingrowing spirit of Orania, I'm finding many such wonderful things in South Africa and such determination to look forward, not back. That is nice, nice Rob. Many de Pico's task may seem impossible, to balance the aspirations of blacks with those of white businesses which keep the economy alive. And yet he approaches it with the same joyous will to succeed, which is the prevalent mood of this vast country. There's always a road near the railway line, very interesting. I've come to Cape Town and the financially impoverished township of Kailisha to find a school choir in exuberant song. Anthems like this evoke long and painful memories, sung in the past by disenfranchised miners or on protest marches. Today, its uplifting cadence has expressed more than mere hope, possibly fulfillment. Each movement and gesture has a significance. The movement now is explaining what they're singing about. Askwazi Ukohamba. We can't walk Kulelizwe, which means in this land of our forefathers, because of this monster. Now, what is this monster? The monster referred to here is the apartheid monster because blacks were restricted to move. Even in town, I couldn't go to Pretoria and walk without a school pass or an ID. Now, what must we do? Notice the new We must oh, rise yes. up, arise, arise and rise and work hard like that the, the, together, like the, 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 the wheels of the train. That is why you found them holding each other, imitating the movement of the train. Yes, and together, yes. Oh, I noticed that. yes, together we can make it if we rise up and work together. Invited home for tea by choir girl Agnes Jubilika. Oh, goodness. you haven't seen that? Between the carriages. Townships like Kailisha have a dangerous reputation for solitary whites. But today it's the local commuters who seem most in peril. Oh my God! I declined the next train too, and eventually we got a taxi to Agnes's home. She lives here in another part of the windswept shanty town of Kailisha, this so-called murder capital of the world boasts the same single-story architecture common to all the world's do-it-yourself townships, from Rio to Bombay. I don't know where I am. <laughs> all right. But amidst the corrugated iron and recycled tea chests, something else is growing, 
and Agnes is its promise. Is this your dog? Yes, this is my dog, Keno. Kellogg. Keno. Oh, Keno. He doesn't look like a breakfast food. <laughs> I've got the most interesting wallpaper you've got, which is made up, actually, of covers of soap. This is the kitchen, the sort of living area. Yes. Is it? And the bedroom. <laughs> and the bedroom. Oh, that's <laughs> and what else? The dining room here. Yeah. And the bedroom here. Yeah. And bedroom there. And yeah, so I'm, but... I'm really, I've got one foot in the bedroom and one foot in the dining room. Yes. <laughs> well, it's a very good Ooh. use of space. That's quite clear. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Does anybody sleep where I'm, li where I'm sitting? Yes. Oh. oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see. You're 16. Yes, I'm really? 16 years old really? and I'm really? son at eight. Oh. And I, my subjects in school is accounting and business economics. Business economics and accounting. Oh. My goodness, that's very advanced. Yes. I never did that. And this is my cousin, sister, that's why. All these are your cousins? Yes. And what do you hope to be when you're 17, 18? University. To be a lawyer. A lawyer? Yes. Does she really want to be a lawyer? Yes. <laughs> oh, another cousin. Another cousin. Where's he come from? That's she. It's a sleeping cousin. It's a tiny cousin. The extraordinary joy of Agnes and her family is infectious. But African problems, and they are substantial, need peculiarly African solutions. I was about to experience these on a rather intimate level. It's been a long journey. I'm in need of a tonic. I visited many doctors in my time for insurance purposes. Oh. Oh, Makusi. But few, if any, with the depressing candor of Nomsa well, the Sangoma. You. Relatively oh. well. Oh, I can see. But you don't look fine. You, you want to come inside, but you, you have to take off your shoes. Oh. Uh, you'll wait for me here because I've still got another gentleman to... Yes, of course. ...to St. Goma is a traditional healer, what Twain would undoubtedly have called a witch doctor. In the bones she's about to toss on the floor, Nomsa reads clues sent by the patient's ancestors. Uh, she'll need a sackful for me. Oh, my God, he doesn't sound very well. What is she doing to him? Nomsa's diagnosis has real value, they tell me. Sick notes from her are accepted by employers. I can issue a certificate that for such and such days, he didn't come for work because... I was treating him. They accept ah, that certificate. They accept that already? Yes. Well, that's very interesting. But yes. do you think this would have happened if there hadn't been such enormous changes within South Africa? The, you know, it was a competition with Western doctors. They were the ones who, who didn't want to accept us. Hmm. But they knew 80% of the people come to us. <laughs> Now it is my turn. I concentrated hard on her bag of bones and shells to the exclusion of anything else. It's a floor x-ray. They take you to the x-ray in yeah. order to see what is wrong with you yes. inside. Yeah. But now in, in, in my profession, I, throw, I do that x-ray by throwing the bones. And then I can read what is wrong with you. Peter is a very strong man. Here, I see your grandmother. You know, he used to love you so much. Well, it might interest you to know <clears throat> it probably comes from Africa then, because she was half Ethiopian. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. My father's mother. But now you feel now this, this, and your, your heart also can't take much. You know your body is full of water, mm. especially the knees. Yeah. And here, you know. Oh, yes, I realize what it is, and you can even feel it. Yeah. But keep, you keep away from overworking yourself. Try to relax. Well, you speak exactly like my wife, and she knows me much better than you do. <laughs> so I'm going to give you only two herbs. So it will help you, because now your weight also. You've noticed? Mm. <sighs> Gives you a problem. How did you know? <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Very, Peter. very sweet of you. <laughs> I felt like a new man. Still, it's too early to throw my stick away. But then I was about to sense wounds deeper than any nomsa's bones could heal. All over South Africa, families are still traumatized by the backwash of apartheid. And yet revenge is not a word I've heard. Why? The answer, in part, is a unique exercise in state forgiveness, the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When black leader Steve Biko died in his cell, the world was repulsed. What was your rank in This policeman was among those responsible. I was a junior sergeant. It's an extraordinary feeling to be looking into the eyes of this man. But this is not a trial. It's a plea by political criminals for amnesty, for reconciliation in return for the truth. It was the Wednesday. For Biko's widow and eldest son, more extraordinary still to hear such forensic and deadpan detail. Mr. Biko then grabbed the chair. I couldn't manage to grab hold of him, and I then grabbed the piece of hose, cut off hose and I hit Mr. Biko several blows. That immediately stopped him in his tracks and he turned towards me and we struggled and as a result of our momentum Mr. Biko's head hit the wall. He fell. How old were you when all this happened to your father? I was approaching seven um, when, when my father died. It was shortly after the Soweto uprisings, of course. Mm. And um, we were young, but we had a general um, uh, feeling of who were the good, who were the bad guys. In my case, my father had been banned since 1973. And um, opposite our house were policemen uh, 24 hours a day. Did you see anybody throwing punches in the room in which Mr. Biko was being interrogated? Yes. Blows were aimed backwards and forwards. Whether the blows actually found their target, I don't know. It's like in a rugby scrum. Yes, without a referee. Is that the only contribution that you think that you might have made to Mr. Biko's death? Yes. Nothing else? No. He's, he's by and large an expressionless face. Uh, and and he's, he's, he's largely indifferent to the pain that you know, with talking about at the hearings. It, it, well, that can suggest two things. Either he has found a way of coming to terms with that history, um, uh, you know, or perhaps, perhaps he doesn't even 20 years later realize the level of pain that he may have caused to various people. But can one forgive when the perpetrators like that policeman seem devoid of remorse? Archbishop Tutu might know he's chairman of the TRC. Do a lot of people get off free, and does it matter? It was part of the price that had to be paid <clears throat> for our transition. You see, if 
uh, at the negotiations, they had decided that uh, all those guilty of uh, gross violations of human rights uh, were for the high jump, then it is highly unlikely that the security forces would have permitted the transition to be as reasonably peaceful as it turned out to be. So that that was the uh, compromise between those who wanted uh, a blanket amnesty, which would have been a uh, tantamount to amnesia, and those who say they wanted the Nuremberg type of trial. Forgiveness is not something nebulous. It's not something uh, ethereal. Uh, for religious people. It is actually deeply pragmatic. It is part of real politic because you come up uh, to the realization that without forgiveness, there is no future. Why in this world is it so bad to change your mind? You're regarded as abandoning convictions and things like that. I believe doubts are more important than convictions myself. Yes, yes, I'm not yes. you, I'm myself, unfortunately. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and I believe doubts are the spur to all thought, because Absolutely. doubts unite people and convictions separate them. Oh, you've got some beautiful ways of saying profound things. Oh, I haven't at all, but I mean, basically we're on the same side. That, that, is, that, is, that is a wonderful thing. Can you imagine if you were opposed to us? I should hate it. <laughs> I should hate it. Of all the places he visited, Twain would have been most surprised by South Africa today. What he called the majestic pile of Table Mountain has not changed since then, and he had foreseen the oppression of blacks. The white man wants their land, he wrote. But it is the dignity and purpose of their renaissance which would have astounded him. I decided to go to the top to behold the beauty of this country and to meditate upon its future. Oh. Cleared up down there, and cleared up here. I feel we're in Daphne du Maurier country. Smugglers, shipwrecks. What's on my back? Is that a person or an animal? It's you! <laughs> I might have known it. may be worse than my Bach, but before I could find out, a live radio interview. Do here, it's John Robbie, and it's a very great pleasure and an Hello? honor to be talking to Sir Peter Eustonov. Yes. Sir Peter, welcome to you. I believe you're on top of Table Mountain. I'm sitting above a sheer precipice with my back to it, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk to you. And uh, it is misty. And uh, I said, it's a bungee jump is paradise. <laughs> and plans maybe to come out and spend more time in South Africa? Is it the sort of place you'd like to return to? Tremendously impressed with South Africa. And I can't imagine anybody leaving it. I mean, I would be part of the brain drain that came back. <laughs> so, Peter Eustonov, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. And Potsins, <laughs> you have to speak two languages here. Uh, if you don't speak the 15 others. Bye-bye. <laughs> He's gnawing my suit, this animal, which I need tonight for Nelson Mandela. Would you get rid of him, please, in a nice way? <laughs> Mandela, I knew, would be on the QE2 that evening. Miraculously, as the clouds parted, I could see the ship at its berth in Cape Town Harbour. My last evening of the journey, and at a fundraising dinner on board, the chance of meeting with the man who embodies all the attributes I have found in South Africa. 
that he's three years older than I am. <laughs> As you know, I and many others spent uh, some time, some picnic, on an island <laughs> for many years. It is tragic to spend such a long time away from your family and from your children. Nevertheless, there are certain aspects of prison which we miss. We miss the time just to sit down to think. That is what we don't have outside jail. But in jail, you could sit down and stand away from yourself and look at your record and be able to say, if I get another chance, this is the role that I'm going to play. Oh, thank you very much. On Robben Island, he had slept on a mat. Here, on his way to his temporary suite on the QE2, the guards were sued. Wow. Oh, again, I'm lost. Your action <laughs> kept us in good spirits in, in prison. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Did I reach there? Oh, yes. well, that fills me with pleasure. Anyway, I've learned all about... I hope I got it right. I, I was taught the word yesterday by Archbishop Tutu. Oh, yes. Uh, Ubuntu. Oh, yes, that's right. Ubuntu. And that's a wonderful feeling. Yes, quite. No, that is true. Uh, it is humility, humility interpreted in African terms. Well, they, I think I ventured to say that you're the first great purely African leader who has really begun to influence other continents. Uh, many of uh, some of the people who are with me in Robin Island will tell you how we followed <coughs> his acting. Gracious. And uh, uh, very his, his imitation of people and so on. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Well, well anyway. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. You no. can't compare me with him. He is uh, so wonderful. Uh, well, and I don't think uh, there's anybody who can really come close to him. I can polish your shoes, you know? Yes. If you want somebody to polish your shoes. Yes. They need polishing, Again. but I, I still don't think that you should do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Ooh, Thank you. I'm up. Thank you, I'm up by some yeah. miracle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. More of an encounter than a conversation. A thousand questions would not have been enough. At its conclusion, Mark Twain described his epic journey as a fine and large thing. For both of us, a century apart, an unforgettable adventure. But Twain had made no predictions, and I will express only a hope. That in the new millennium, we will be allowed to forget, not merely incited, to remember.
planet Ustinov following the equator with Sir Peter Ustinov by Michael Waldron.